good afternoon and welcome to the Eisenhower Presidential Library. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Joy Murphy. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement. And this is the kickoff to our 2023 uh, programming. Our theme for the year is Difficult Decisions. Um, leadership is very hard, and, and when we are in leadership positions, sometimes we have to make hard decisions. So this whole season will be about some of the hard decisions that had to be made during the Eisenhower administration. So again, we thank you for joining us. And to kick off this season, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Lori Kloon, and she will talk to us about the, the Rosenbergs. So Dr. Kloon, take it away. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then go right on into your presentation. Thank you so much, Joy, and thank you so much. I wish I could be in Abilene. I loved being in Abilene. I loved doing research there. I'm sorry I can't be there. I know it's a bit cold today, so maybe it's better to be in California right now, but um, it's delightful to be here. Thank you all so much uh, for, for coming uh, in there, out there, wherever you are. Um, I am Lori Kloon. I'm a professor of history at uh, California State University, Fresno. I do a lot of diplomatic history, political history, though I am moving into some cultural history. Uh, which is very interesting um, and pulling me in different directions. Um, but uh, here today, we're talking about uh, my first book and specifically looking at um, Eisenhower's role, of course, which is, I think, fascinating, like a really, really interesting case study, a great way. And I'm honored to be part of this difficult decisions um, uh, series because I think this is a really interesting one that's often overlooked. It's so early in his administration. And so many other things get over overshadow it, I think. Um, and we sometimes forget the role, the key role that Eisenhower played. It, it seems to be so centered on, on Harry Truman. So um, delighted to be here, delighted to talk about, um, and that is my first book, Executing the Rosenbergs, Death and Diplomacy in a Cold War World, uh, which came out with Oxford in uh, 2016, which seems like a million years ago now. Um, but so my thought for today, as we're trying to focus a bit more on uh, President Eisenhower himself is, is to at first do, and we can flip to the next slide and look at kind of what, what my focus is here. We're gonna, we're gonna do a bit of a case overview. Um, some folks may be very well aware of the case and others might be slightly less. So let's just do a, a, a quick case overview so we all are aware of the, the important facts. Um, we'll look at the role of the presidents, both both Truman and Eisenhower. We'll put it in some context because this case doesn't make any sense without some really entrenched Cold War context. Also highlighting the protest movement, which did have an impact on Eisenhower and his administration. Look at his decision, uh, the two times in his administration when he had the opportunity to weigh in on this case. Um, and then we'll look at the effects of that talk a little bit about what I think the conclusions or some conclusions that can be drawn from this. And then I'll leave time um, for, for Q&A because that to me is, is the best part. It's, it's so interesting, um, the questions that people have and, and it just furthers my knowledge as well. So selfishly, I really like that part. Um, so let's start with the case overview itself. And I apologize if you are aware of the case, I, I don't mean to belittle, uh, but uh, this is just to make sure we're all on the same page. So you should see two photographs there. The, the one on the left, that's um, David and Ruth Greenglass. Uh, and David was arrested in New York City in 1950 uh, for stealing atomic bomb secrets. Uh, when he pled guilty, he named the man who was running the spy ring that he was working with. And that man happened to be his brother-in-law, Julius. So you see on the right, Ethel and Julius. Ethel is David's older sister. Uh, so when David points to Julius, then FBI agents, <coughs> pardon me, FBI agents um, go into the very small apartment uh, that the Rosenbergs lived in with their two sons in July of 1950, uh, arrest Julius uh, Rosenberg, he uh, was an engineer and he did control a military spy ring of about a dozen engineers. Frankly, David's role was pretty minimal, but David was someone who was willing to testify against his brother-in-law and ultimately against his sister. Um, so Julius was officially charged with conspiracy to commit espionage 
specifically the accusation concerned the passing of what they called the secret of the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. There is no one secret, so it's a, it's a bit complicated, um, but it certainly uh, pointed to the seriousness of the charge. And even though it's conspiracy to commit espionage, which is really interesting because we understand what espionage is, spying, right? Conspiracy is, do you want to rob a bank? Yes, let's rob a bank. Okay, now we're all part of the conspiracy, right? So it's cognizance. Um, and, and so that's an easier thing uh, to prove. And that's what they accused Julius of. And famously, this is part of the Espionage Act, which is still in effect today. Um, they're pressuring Julius to talk. Julius won't talk, right? David talked. That was it. He pointed to Julius. Now they're pressuring Julius because they believe if they can get him to talk, he'll name the other nearly dozen engineers who are part of this firing. Julius won't talk. He won't talk. Uh, nearly a month later, they decide, and they meaning the Truman administration, Justice Department, FBI, decide that they're going to arrest Ethel, Julius's wife, and use her, as J. Edgar Hoover admitted, use her as a lever to get Julius to talk. Um, they arrest her. Still, Julius won't talk. Neither will Ethel. Famously, they will never name any names. Um, and so they threaten them, well, even before the trial occurs, they threaten them with the death penalty. Again, in documentation, it says, we did this because we wanted them to talk. We wanted them to know this was serious, and we wanted them to talk and name these other spies. That was the whole purpose of, of all of this. Um, we can go to the next slide because we can see that Julius and Ethel, there they are on the left, but on the right are their two sons. Um, it's Michael and Robert. They were age seven and three at the time of their arrest, about six and 10 uh, when they were executed. Uh, Julius and Ethel uh, were uh, Jewish. They were Communist Party members. Uh, that membership tapered off a bit. Usually when folks started spying, they weren't active members of uh, the Communist Party. Um, but when the government charges them with conspiracy, again, conspiracy to commit espionage under the Espionage Act of 1917, it's four actions, they say, that Julius engaged in, so spying activities from June of 1944 through to the time of David's arrest in June of 1950. So we're going 1944 to 1950. What that meant is that some of this happened during World War II, which famously ends later in 1945. And so from Julius's perspective, we should give all the knowledge we have about any military secrets to our ally, the Soviet Union. And we can you know, disagree with that interpretation, but that was what Julius felt. What's interesting, that's a lot of interesting things. One of the interesting things about the Espionage Act is that it, it was giving information that was uh, damaging to the national security of the United States. And you could, if you were sentenced under this particular statute within the Espionage Act, you could be sentenced to death or put in prison for no more than 30 years. And this will be a problem because many folks are like, can't we just give them a life sentence? That was not an option under this statute within the Espionage Act. And that will become a bit of a problem, frankly. Um, so it's either the death sentence or no more than 30 years in prison. Uh, the couple pleads not guilty. They refuse to cooperate with the prosecution. They refuse to name names. Eight days prior to the trial, uh, and more than five months after Ethel was arrested, the FBI FBI agents re-interview David Greenglass, who has now pled guilty. Right, he's he's named Julius. He's pled guilty, um, and the FBI agents, again, this is eight days before the trial, say to David, uh, "If you don't give us more information, we're going to arrest your wife." Ruth. And Ruth actually was involved. She was helping pass information from David 
to Ruth, to Julius, to the Soviets. Ethel was not involved in that process. Um, and so David had to say something to make sure that they didn't arrest his wife. So at that interview, he claimed that Ethel not only knew about Julius's espionage activities, which everyone was pretty sure that was true, um, but that she typed reports, that Ethel typed reports for Julius. We know now that is false, that later in his life, David Greenglass admitted that he lied to save the life of his wife because he had children as well. Okay. Um, so in order to effectively prosecute Ethel, they pressured David to give more testimony against uh, uh, Ethel, which he did. Uh, the trial is in March of 1951. It ends in three weeks, which seems incredibly fast <laughs> for pr present day. Um, and the jury found them guilty. For this kind of a trial, the judge did the sentencing, not the jury. The judge sentenced David Greenglass, who had admitted to his guilt, sentenced him to 15 years in prison, which he was very surprised. He thought he'd get a much lesser sentence. Uh, the judge also sentenced the uncooperative couple, Julius and Ethel, to death. They scheduled the executions for two months later, but there was an immediate stay process and the, the appeals occurred and occurred and occurred. Um, and this would take us well into 1953. Um, so the role of the president, so we can go to the next slide and look at who are the president? Oh, sorry, we got to do the death um, part. I forgot to put this in there. So they are executed. I mean, not, you know, spoiler, I guess you probably knew this. Um, they were executed uh, June 19th, 1953. Um, uh, together, they were, they were um, often lumped together in this, the Rosenbergs, as opposed to, how I argue that you really do need to treat them separately. Julius was a spy. There is really very, very, very little, if any, evidence that Ethel was a spy, but she was cognizant of her husband's activities. On the right is the um, their gravestones and a um, cemetery on Long Island. Um, so uh, they they will die and, and leave their their children. Uh, there's a some challenges with who's going to raise them. Ultimately, they're adopted by a lovely couple, and they from all accounts, turned out quite well. Um, Michael is a retired economics professor and Robert uh, is, I think, still an acting lawyer. So rather accomplished individuals considering what they went through with all of this. Um, and as we'll see, I mean, they believed that their parents were innocent until well into the 1980s, 1990s, when they had to admit that their father was indeed a spy. Okay, so I think the next slide is the two presidents we're talking about here. Um, so starts with Harry Truman, right, on, on the left. Um, <clears throat> it's the Truman administration that decides to go after Julius. Why? Well, we'll talk about Cold War context in a minute, but part of it is you go after the spies that you can, right? Here's here's a spy. Maybe he's not the biggest. He's He's important, but he's not huge. He's not Klaus Fuchs. He's not as big as some of these other spies, um, but he's a spy you can get to because of David Greenglass's testimony. And so because of that, Truman and the Truman administration decides they're going to use Julius as an example. This is what happens if you spy. This is serious, right? We're in a cold war now. There's We're not weak. We're going to treat this very, very seriously. Once the trial occurs, right, when they're arrested, the trial, the sentencing, then it does become a presidential decision because, as you know, the president can weigh in on these issues. And Truman decides not to. By the time the paperwork comes to the Oval Office, it's like the last week of his administration. And I'm pretty sure Harry Truman looked at it and said, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to leave this on the desk for the next guy. Um, that transition between Truman and Eisenhower, you may know, was not very smooth. They did not get along very well. And so I think Truman felt, I'm not going to handle this. I'm going to leave this hot potato <laughs> uh, for Eisenhower to deal with. I'm also going to leave him with an incredibly unpopular war in Korea, and he's just going to have to deal with all of this. So 
really with Truman pushing that decision aside, it is Eisenhower who gets the burden of what to do as president. Now he could, here are his options. He could pardon either one or both of the Rosenbergs and release them. And we will see for lots of reasons that seems unlikely, extremely unlikely really. He could commute their sentences to the 30 years. So to go from the, the execution to 30 years in prison. And of course the, the thought was 30 years in prison, they might talk. And if that's really what you want, yes, you wanna make an example, but you also want them to talk. Because if they can name those other spies, we break up a really large spy ring, which was no longer functional since they had, the Rosenbergs had been arrested, but, uh, and Julius in particular, um, but still the idea of getting to those other spies because those other spies don't actually, they are not held accountable because Julius and Ethel never talk. So he could pardon them, release them completely. He could reduce the sentence to that 30 years. And you think about like them sitting in prison for 30 years, it's just a really interesting idea. They may have actually talked at some point, right? I mean, their their sons are coming to visit and, you know, it, it's very interesting. And I would argue the death sentence is, is really what keeps them on the front pages. So it might have been to everybody's advantage to try the 30 year thing. Or the third option, allow the judge's execution ruling to stand. And part of what, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but part of what the judge says in sentencing them to death is you, Julius and Ethel, caused the Korean War. I'm gonna pick that up when we get to Korea in a moment. Um, but that connection made it so that certainly Americans were like, yes, they should be executed for this. They called it treason, even though that's not the charge against them. So it's Eisenhower who has two opportunities to weigh in on this, and he would have the final say. So twice he denies clemency, once in February of 1953 and again in June of 1953. Um, and then they are executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison, as I said, June 19th, 1953. Okay, this case doesn't make any sense unless you put it very solidly within a Cold War context. Um, so the next slide looks, we'll, we'll, we'll try to grapple with the Cold War context because especially when you teach this, you know, to students who weren't even alive at 9-11, I mean, very young, um, you're trying to explain the fear and without the Cold War fear, it doesn't make sense. The photo on the left indicates the incredible fear that Americans felt in August of 1949 when the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb. And frankly, you know, Americans freaked out. Much of the world freaked out. Up until 19, so think about it, from 1945 until 1949, the United States had a monopoly on atomic bombs. We were the only country on the planet who had that knowledge. It was never a question of if other countries would get that knowledge. It was a, a question of when, because this is obtainable knowledge. Did they get it faster because of spies? Yeah, probably folks thought it would take five or six years. It took more like four. So mostly that was because of information from spies like Klaus Fuchs, who provided crucial information, but not all information from spies is helpful. Sometimes it brings you down a different road based on what point in the development it's occurring. So it's not a, it's not a neat process, but certainly getting the bomb and the United States no longer having the monopoly uh, terrified Americans. So that's a key point in August of 1949. And what it does is prompts, as the photo on the right indicates, um, the panic, the fear, the ducking and covering, which some of us remember doing, right? Ducking under your desk, um, the fear that now that the Soviets have, have the atomic bomb, they could, it's not, a, it's not in, a, in, a, in a missile yet, but they could fly a plane over and they could drop an atomic bomb anywhere in the United States. 
And that was absolutely terrifying. And sure, we can look at that and go, how are you going to live? You know, you're under a wooden desk like this defies logic. Yes. Part of it was to calm students so that they felt that we had a plan somehow. You know, um, But that fear of never knowing if the Soviets were going to take this information and take their newly developed atomic bomb and use it on the United States, because by 46 and 47, the United States and the Soviet Union are at this, you know, real loggerheads of who's going to run the planet. Is it going to lean towards democracy or is it going to lean lean towards communism? And that that confrontation is felt everywhere. I would argue in every country, gosh, we even see it on the moon. <laughs> who's getting to the moon first, right? I, we see that that tension, that strain, that conflict um, is pervasive and impacts every, I would argue, and historians would argue, every decision that's being made in these crucial early Cold War years. So we can't take the fear away. The fear is essential, right? The fear is, it, it, none of this makes sense without that element of just incredible I, we would argue, right, rational fear. I mean, fear is not rational, but if you believe that your enemy could, you know, nuke you at any moment, that's that's a palpable fear, right? Okay, so the next thing that causes uh, strain uh, on the next slide um, is just, let's see, August, September, October, two months, two months from the Soviets dropping their first atomic, testing their first atomic bomb to China becoming the largest communist country on the planet. Now, at the time, the assumption was that Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin were, you know, buddies and hanging out and, you know, and we know now that that relationship was quite strained. But if you believe that communism is the monolith, then the Soviet Union, a rather large country, and now add to it communist China, you have created a space where communism is proceeding, expanding, threatening the United States and their allies. So that's a huge moment when China becomes a communist country. The very next year, a hot war, right in the middle of this Cold War, the hot, a hot war breaks out in Korea. Um, the Korean War parallels the Rosenberg case almost identically. It's kind of amazing, really. Um, June 1950 is when a, a major assault by North Korea into South Korea. And the war itself will end in July of 1953, six weeks after the executions of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. So the parallels are really interesting. I say ends the war. I know it, it's not over, right? It was a, it was a, a armistice. It's not, there's no official end. The, the Korean War is technically still going on and the countries are, are divided. Um, famously, Truman called uh, the Korean War a police action, uh, but this is the moment where the United States and 12 of its allies together under the umbrella of the United Nations go into South Korea to support the, it's hard to call it a democratic government in South Korea, but certainly an anti-communist government in South Korea um, and protect them from an invasion in North Korea. Okay. Um, this seemed to indicate that communism was spreading, right? I mean, with, with just in these few months, we see this spread into China, the spread from North Korea in this invasion into South Korea. This seems like a, a legitimate threat. Um, nuclear bombs are a constant reminder. They're actually, Truman at one point and Eisenhower at one point, think about possibly using nuclear weapons in the Korean war theater. So nuclear bombs are a constant reminder that a global apocalypse was a horrifyingly real threat. Um, and because nuclear weapons really pretty soon the realization that this would result in a mutually assured destruction, right? Or mad, right? They nuke, we nuke, they nuke, we nuke. Words, what 
what diplomatic historians call soft power becomes really important because you can't just bomb everything, right? So even while this hot war is going on, there is a real push to be better at propaganda. Soviets are using propaganda. We're using, pro you know, every country is using propaganda from the U.S. perspective. And especially with Eisenhower, who really believed in the power of good propaganda. You want to use propaganda to convince your allies that they're on the right side, right? Yep, the allies, these are, this is where you should be. But also convince what we used to call third world countries, right? Look to those countries and say, you, you want to join us. You're, you're moving into um, independence, usually breaking free from you know, colonial powers. You, you want to be on our side. We're the side to be on. So you're using soft power. You're using global image making to convince your allies they're, they're on the right side and to convince others to join you, right? The non-aligned to join you. And so what Eisenhower believes, and Truman tried this, I think Eisenhower tried it a little better, frankly, um, was to convince the world that the spies, these two spies were guilty um, and they needed to die. And that in getting to these two spies, we were going to uh, project, the United States would project um, the superiority of American democracy. And you can see in the, the map on the right there, it, it shows the countries that have been um, subsumed in this you know, spreading uh, communism. Um, you can see the United States and get, you know, democracies. And then you've got these, these blue and, and green that are kind of, some of them are gaining independence and deciding what countries to align with. And so this is all about how do we convince those folks? right? That these spies are guilty and they deserve to die. And by executing them, we are projecting, the United States is projecting superiority of American democracy and the superiority of our judicial system. Okay. Here's the challenge. It's hard to do that. <laughs> so if we look at the next slide, um, what this indicates are the countries around the world from 1952 to 1954 who protested the upcoming and then subsequent execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. So that map and all the lines are just lines that are going to DC because what I did is looked at documents where folks were in embassies uh, around the world, as you can see, I mean, it's hardly a spot on the planet that wasn't impacted by this, that we had protesters, you know, against this case in Madagascar, <laughs> you know, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, in places in Africa, throughout Europe, Latin America, you know, just all over the place, Canada. Um, what, would, what would happen is folks in those embassies would notice protest movements that were gaining uh, attention. And they would write to Washington, D.C., to the State Department and say, what should we do? Right. We've got to deal with this. They, they have questions about the case. They have questions about the death penalty. How do we address those? Uh, and the Eisenhower administration, in part, really tried to grapple with some of that stuff. But it was really, really hard because this was a lot there. Now we know there were about 84 cities in nearly 50 countries around the world that had documented protest movements that ranged from 100 people to 15,000. Uh, and it was letters and it was petitions and it was protests and, and it was, you know, it, it, it just uh, stationing outside of embassies and it was a constant barrage. And there were particular challenges to this case that prompted these protests, mostly that you know, there was no one secret of the uh, atomic bomb, that the, um, the, the guilt of Ethel was questionable because it seemed to only be based on the testimony of her brother and there didn't seem to be any other um, evidence. Uh, and we now know that she was cognizant of the spying, but she was not an active spy herself. We don't have time for it, but there were a lot of irregularities in this trial. Um, the prosecutors uh, in, were involved in misconduct. Uh, the defense lawyers were not especially effective. Um, 
uh, and then the Supreme Court weighs in, and that was seen as inadequate and complicated. Um, there were communications between the prosecutors and the judge that were illegal. I mean, there were all kinds of things. But ultimately, the thing that is the biggest problem for these protest movements, and the thing that I would argue the Eisenhower administration doesn't really grapple with as well as we would hope, um, was the death sentence. That the death sentence was seen as extreme. If they had been sentenced to 30 years, they would not be on the front page of newspapers around the world. But because of the death sentence, and because federal officials decided that to break the Rosenbergs, right? Remember, the whole thing is to get them to talk. To break them, let's bring their, their sons to visit Sing Sing Prison every couple of weeks. And that's going to be on the front page of the paper, right? These cute kids going to visit their parents. The idea was if they keep seeing their sons, they'll eventually break down and name names, which they don't do. So let's look at a couple of We've got some allied photos. So here's some protests in allied countries, right? Canada, what have you done today to help save the Rosenbergs? Um, big protest movement throughout Canada, big protest movement in Australia. Uh, these were embarrassing, right? These were our allies. Why didn't they understand? Why didn't they understand? And I don't, it's complicated how much Eisenhower was really aware. There were people in his administration who were aware, but I don't think he was told as much about the global protest movement as you would imagine he would have been told. Um, next slide, we can see um, that it gets more complicated for Eisenhower in January of 53, right? So Eisenhower is inaugurated in January of 53. Um, a few weeks prior to that, Pope Pius the 12th, I believe, let's just call him Pope Pius to be sure I get that right, um, came out against the death sentence for the Rosenbergs. This is huge. This is a huge problem. Eisenhower is trying to get uh, religious leaders around the world to join in the anti-communism cause, right? Let communism is atheistic. We've got to get all these um, religious leaders together. The Pope hugely significant, right? And so when the leader of the Catholic church around the world comes out and says, sure, communism is, is bad, but executing these people is worse. When he says that, it's a huge problem for Eisenhower because he then, because the Pope says it, dozens of Catholic countries around the world follow suit, particularly throughout Latin America. And these are folks who are protesting, literally holding signs that say, even if they're guilty, I don't care, just put them in prison. It's the death sentence that makes it hard. A few weeks after the Pope comes out against the death sentence, Eisenhower denies executive clemency to the Rosenbergs for the first time. And he affirms the death sentence. And he explains that it's essential that uh, we have to go after the spies that we can, the world is not safe, we need to make an example, all of the things that you would imagine that he would say, um, and protests in reaction to that and following the lead of the Pope, protests throughout Catholic countries erupts. And these are countries, like I said, throughout um, Latin America, um, but also in um, former, in, in, in French colonies, and in some cases, former French colonies, um, there are protests in Vietnam, there are you know, lots of people follow in this line. And he's not the only one, right, who's come out, but he's certainly one of the most important in terms of his uh, global presence. So the next slide, we look at the reaction in France, which is particularly interesting. Um, France, France, obviously, you know, our oldest, America's oldest ally. Um, and yeah, this is disturbing. If you haven't seen the, 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 the drawing to the right, that's uh, Louis Mittelberg's uh, sketch. Um, and it's entitled His Famous Smile. And what he did is he took Eisenhower's, you know, beautiful, large smile and replaced his teeth with little electric chairs. And this wasn't just a, a poster that he created, but rather gave it to protesters and they plastered it all over, not just Paris, but actually all over the cities throughout France. Um, protests in Paris, uh, and some would say, well, sure, they protested you know, on a Tuesday, it's really common. But the problem was 
the, the, it was such a problem for the United States because of the relationship between the United States and France. And because the things that the French were saying was not just protesters, not just some regular folks, it was going up to high levels of the government. Um, and so that becomes embarrassing for the Eisenhower administration and a complication. So I want to look at one on the next slide. We've got one example of this. Um, so Ambassador uh, C. Douglas Dillon, uh, U.S. Ambassador, uh, lifelong uh, Republican, a rather conservative fellow, um, he wrote, we know now, uh, more than a dozen times from uh, Paris to the Eisenhower administration, to Dulles, to the Secretary of State, saying, we got an issue here. This, this is not going well. As you see, just the one quote I have, I am deeply concerned with the long-term effect of the possible execution of the Rosenbergs. So he is seeing things, as I said, not just regular people on the street, but now it's going up into the high levels of, um, of religious leaders in France, throughout France, uh, and political leaders going all the way up, the highest uh, levels in the French government. And he's very, very, very concerned. Um, I want to read just a wee bit. I've got a minute. So I think I can just do a wee bit of this. We're almost done. Uh, but there is a, I mean, this memo in particular is one of the most, I think, one of the most interesting because he's able to articulate some of his concerns. The assumption was all the protesters must be communist, right? Only, only communists would protest this kind of thing. And he very clearly says, and he's very well respected. Dulles really likes this guy. I don't know why he doesn't listen to him a bit more. He says, we should not, this is Dylan saying this in the telegram, we should not deceive ourselves by thinking that this sentiment is due principally to communist propaganda or that people who take this position are unconscious dupes of communists. The fact is the great majority of French people of all political leanings feel that the death sentence is completely unjustified from a moral standpoint and is due to the particular political climate in the United States, referring to aggressive anti-communism, which we sometimes refer to as McCarthyism. Um, he goes on to say that he believes long-term damage could occur with the relationship between the United States and France if the Rosenbergs are executed. Okay, next slide. Um, about, what is that? Two and a half weeks before the executions, um, the Washington Post becomes the first uh, press within the United States uh, to come out and say, you know, it was right that the judge sentenced them to death. But now, because of this growing anti, um, pro you know, this protest movement, you know, trying to keep the Rosenbergs alive, because of this growing movement around the world, the Washington Post comes out in an editorial and says the president could hardly ignore the fact that the case had become a powerful instrument of anti-American agitation abroad. And they come out and say, Eisenhower should be the better man to step in and say, let's... Uh, Let's put them in prison for 30 years, and then they, perhaps they will talk. Let's not hand the Soviet Union to martyrs, which is one of the things that the Washington Post argues. Which gives an indication, and just a quick slide on the next one, is um, that within the United States, while we see on the left, those are folks who are protesting the Rosenberg executions, um, the vast majority of Americans the propaganda that that the the spin or however you want to look at it of of what Truman and and then especially Eisenhower does is effective within the United States. Within the United States, uh, the vast majority of Americans believe that the Rosenbergs should be executed. They believe that they caused the Korean War. They believe that they deserve to die. It is not an issue. I mean, you can see the photo on the right there. Rosenbergs die tonight. The man is smiling. That was very common. Very common. There were there were folks who were who were um, celebrating after their executions within the United States. Uh, it, there was one famous case where this girl was like ten years old, and and she said, "I wish I had been the one to flick the switch." Um, and they, you know, this within the United States, Eisenhower's popularity never dips below sixty percent, which is 
astonishing numbers when you think of today. Um, but he is not damaged in any way politically by allowing these executions to occur. It's only in that global context. So again, within the United States, I mean, he's the president of the United States. He does what the American people want in a sense, right? This is, he, he did what he wanted or what they wanted. Um, and on the next slide, you can see that he had these two opportunities, February of 1953 and then June of 1953. Um, and I think part of his rationale uh, is highlighted in a really interesting letter uh, that he wrote to his son, John, uh, three days before the scheduled executions. And of course, it's so small, I can hardly read it, but I can try. Uh, to address myself more specifically to the Rosenberg case for a minute, I must say that it goes against the grain to avoid interfering in the case where a woman is to receive capital punishment. Over again, this, however, must be placed um, one over again against this, it must be placed one or two facts that have great significance. The first of these is that in this instance, it is the woman who is strong and recalcitrant, uh, strong and recalcitrant character. The man is the weak one. And this is, there's a long story of why he believes this and something that the FBI wrote. And it, it, it doesn't really align with reality, but it's what he believed. It's what he was told, um, particularly by J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, she has obviously been the leader in everything they did in the spy ring. Again, the facts don't really bear that out, but this is what he believes at the time. And that's what we need to do is understand what he, he understood at the time. Um, the second thing is that uh, if there would be any commuting of the woman's sentence, right, the thought was, okay, maybe let Julius die, but commute Ethel's sentence um, without the man's, then from here on, the Soviets would simply uh, recruit their spies from among women. So then it would just be all women because the United States would have indicated in Eisenhower's view here, and he's writing to his sons, so we believe this is, you know, his true belief, um, that it would make the United States look weak uh, to not go after with all that the courts had allowed um, to go after these two spies that they were able to get their hands on. Um, and, you know, for Eisenhower, a lifelong military man, there's a chain of command, right? It's very clear. Uh, and this is what the, they got a trial. I mean, we can look back and say perhaps it wasn't as fair as it should have been. Uh, but he said they got a trial, they got appeals, the Supreme Court even looked at it. I will not interfere. And that's what he says in that in that June 1953 uh, decision against clemency. He said they have they have received all the, the lines. The judicial system has worked. I will not interfere in this matter. This will follow the path. He felt it was just beyond what the president should do. Um, so the complication, um, as historian David Cout wrote here in 1978, is that when they die in June of uh, 1953, it appeared to folks uh, around the world, sometimes allies, sometimes potential allies, that the United States was going against its own um, traditions, right? As, as David says here, when official America sins, she sins doubly against her victims and against her own traditions, ideals, and rhetoric. Uh, that that we that the, in the United States holds it up up to a higher standard, and because of that, the uh, allowing this execution to occur indicated not strength, as Eisenhower truly believed, but perhaps even weakness in not uh, aligning with the. Uh, traditions and ideals and rhetoric. And it's complicated as we as we end up here. Um, I would argue, and I do argue, because this is the last couple of sentences of my book, um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, through their actions and deceptions by saying they were completely innocent the entire time, uh, led liberals on a wild goose chase and tarnished the global credibility of liberalism. All those liberals who believed they were innocent. Cold War terror and paranoia drove the U.S. government to prosecute the couple, but in killing them, federal officials truly failed. They failed to compel the couple to talk, right? Dead spies don't famously talk. They failed to deter future spies. People don't stop spying because of this. In fact, there are more spies during the Reagan administration than, than in the 1940s and 50s. And they ultimately failed to convince the world that executing the Rosenbergs was anything but a morally repugnant travesty of justice. And that's, I think, the missed opportunity. And that's the, the, the complication, I think, that, that early in his administration, Eisenhower wasn't as savvy to as we think, because he's, he's known for being so savvy about propaganda. And it's surprising 
how he responded to this. You can imagine him in that second one, the June one, saying, you know what, we're going to take the high ground. They should be in prison and uh, and perhaps talk at some point, which is what we really want. Um, and again, death penalty off the table changes the ballgame, I would argue, completely. Takes the wind out of, out of all those global protest movements, right, and changes everything. Okay, I'm sorry, that was a lot, <laughs> a lot to, to mash in there. Um, but I am happy to answer any questions, anything I've gone over too quickly. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, for Dr. Kloon, for that presentation. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and start typing them in the chat. If you are in person with us down in the courtyard of the Eisenhower Library, you do have some pads and pencils on your table. Please feel free to write your questions down. And our host down there, um, our curator, William Snyder, will type those questions in our chat as well. Um, before I ask my questions, there are some comments uh, in, in the chat. So I'll just read them out to you and you can respond how you see fit. Um, this one is long. So it says, I'm going to try to summarize it here. It says, in general, spies were usually exchanged for other spies. That's what happened to Gary Powers. It was a German bridge famous for that. Also, the Venona decree revealed that there were over, it should be Venona, okay, that's Benona, what it yeah. says. Um, yeah. There were over 260 Soviet moles in the Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. It would appear that this case had strong underlying political motivation. I think I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, so much of this, and, and you can look through, look at a lot of uh, Truman and especially Eisenhower reaction um, during the Cold War as a political motivation to um, you know, really grapple with the legacy of the New Deal, frankly, that, that so many saw the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal going far too left and being virtually akin to communism. Um, the fact that there were Soviet spies within um, the Roosevelt administration indicated that, that this was not a tenable legacy, right, for for these these Cold War years when it became such an existential threat. Um, the Venona transcripts are so interesting because, by all accounts, Truman and Eisenhower didn't know about them, and they had to rely on federal officials to say, "No, we really have information. We know that." the Rosenbergs are spies. We have access to, and it's a complicated story, but we do have access to some of these um, Venona uh, decryptions, and they really don't indicate that Ethel was a spy, but that she was cognizant, as I said, but not an active spy. So um, it's a complication. The problem why they can't be used in court is because we didn't want the Soviets to know we were decrypting their, their correspondence. So it's not until David Greenglass testifies that they're like, okay, now we've got someone who will, who will testify. And that's what you need in a court of law, right? You can't, you have to have evidence. So that's why Venona is such an interesting, has an interesting role in this. Yeah. Great point. So I do want to elaborate on something, or I'm going to ask if you would elaborate a little bit on something that you said, um, and that was in John, in the letter to John, and mm -hmm. that was um, the intel that I received that that made him believe that had him believing that Ethel was the real ringleader. Um, you don't have to go into what into too much detail, but just can you give us a little bit about that intel. It's so interesting. I, you know, there's just this case has layers of like, so, so apparently J. Edgar Hoover, right, director of the FBI, hires a psychiatrist to psychoanalyze. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. He doesn't meet them, but he's able to psychoanalyze them, which is a little problematic, right? Wow. <laughs> but he says, he writes things like, you know, all communists do this. All communist women run the household, all communist men are subservient. He These broad generalizations. And so he comes to the conclusion, again, not having met Julius or Ethel, uh, decides that she is the ringleader and that she needs to be held responsible because she's running the show. 
and if anyone's going to die, it has to be her. Um, and Eisenhower is looking at J. Edgar Hoover, who says, you know, if she was such a good mother, she wouldn't have spied in the first place. Uh, and then gives him this report where this guy says, you know, I've psychoanalyzed them and this is what is happening. And he believes the experts because that's the, the evidence he's, he's getting. It's very problematic. Interesting that how gender and gender roles oh, play a role in this. It's the role of gender in this case is thought about it like that. It's so interesting. It is so interesting. In fact, I make the point that um, the night they were executed, there was an episode of Ozzie and Harriet on television. And that episode was one in which Harriet was complaining to Ozzie that she doesn't know enough about what he does at work. I thought it was so ironic <laughs> that the night that Ethel is executed for knowing enough about her husband's work to be executed was the same night that Ozzie and Harriet were talking. I don't know. Just those, yeah. I mean, 50s women. What a fascinating. I mean, she was damned if she didn't, damned if she didn't. I mean, you know, she tried right. to portray herself as a good mom. And they were like, well, if you were such a good mom, you wouldn't have let your husband spy. And, I, you know, it's just, yeah, really interesting. Um. A couple of questions that I have uh, that are in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, where did you learn that Julius's motive was that the atomic knowledge should be available to others? So in letters that he wrote to his sons, some of those have been published, not all of them, but some of them, he indicated that he believed that the world was a safer place if military information could be spread, particularly to the Soviet Union, who he again, quite idealistically believed was one way and history bore out that that was not exactly the case, but he believed that the world would be safer if certainly our allies had access to all of this technology, not just atomic, right? I mean, somebody mentioned Gary Powers, that proximity fuse was handed, I mean, that's one thing that Julius actually handed to the Soviets was the proximity fuse, um, which is you know, quite damning. I know that that's something I've heard before, that there are a lot of people who believe if everyone has access to these kind of same similar technologies, that it'll make the world a safer place. Yeah. And I, I mean, we can look at that as naive. That or not, but but, yeah, I know a lot of people do. Right. And it, but it was ultimately not his call. right? <laughs> I don't think he's allowed to say that. Yeah. Um, Somebody wrote, I didn't know about Julius, um, but I know that it was Klaus Fuchs's motivation. Yeah, first, definitely Klaus Fuchs. And of course, his information is essential. I mean, his information saves the Soviets probably a year or two because he's actually a physicist. So, you know, David Greenglass was a machinist. He didn't have, you know, advanced knowledge. So what he gave, one historian told me off the cuff that what David Greenglass passed on to the Soviets saved the Soviet Union about 15 minutes. Not quite, <laughs> not quite the holy grail of <laughs> atomic weapon information. <laughs> well, there is a question in here about David Greenglass. It says, why do we believe David Greenglass Glass's recanting of Ethel being the typist if yeah. he lied once? Right. And assume he's, he's still lying. He's such an, oh, such an interesting character. Sam Roberts wrote a great book called The, the Brother. And he had access to David Greenglass before he passed, um, and and he interviewed him, and and it's it's fascinating. I I, I highly recommend it. It's a it's a great disturbing read. Um, why does he admit it? I it's hard to believe he has guilt. I don't know. I think he did say, "I never in my wildest dreams imagined that my testimony would lead to her death." No one prepared him for the possibility that she might be executed. And maybe that wore on him over the years, and he admitted. I. It, it's hard to know. It's a really interesting family dynamic, for sure. Well, and I would, I would maybe, it, of course, it would be a guess. But you know, at what does he have to gain from recanting at this point? So you know, maybe. Maybe that is to be believed at this point, you know? Yeah, I mean, he, if you're cynical, and I suppose we should bring a bit of cynicism, by admitting this, it did, and he got a bit of an advance from that book by doing the interviews with Sam Roberts, which was quite controversial. Um, 
you know, he did benefit in that way. He also did a, a 60 Minutes interview where he admitted as well. Yeah, it's it's rather disturbing. We should mention real quick that there, there are really cool um, documents on the Eisenhower Library website. Yes, so we've got that up there. Um, so there's all kinds of really interesting things that you can read thanks to technology and um, you know National Archive funding that you can access. Um, some really interesting documents that kind of flesh some of this stuff out. So um, it's super helpful. Yes, thank you for highlighting that. We always wanna um, highlight and thank our archive team for doing the work and they are cataloging, they are scanning, they are digitizing. So we want to always um, shout them out and thank them for their hard work. No, it's incredible. None of, history doesn't get written at all without the incredible work of archivists. So these are the most remarkable people. And I will say the Eisenhower Library was the best I've ever worked in. They were just absolutely, absolutely delightful. Could not have, I was so nervous my first time. They were they were incredible. It's a, it's a wonderful space. I hope folks get a chance to Especially, I mean, you know, jump online and it's amazing how much stuff is is available there. It's really cool. Well, thank you for that. We'll be sure to pass that on. Um, as you can see, scrolling through our website, there's a research page. If you ever, if there's anyone out there who would like to come and do research, you can request that. And we are happy to help here. But I will pass your praises on to our archive team. Thank you. Please do. It's really, um, I mean, this wouldn't have happened without those folks. Yeah. I... Let's see. Oh, here's a question. I see a lot of parallels between the executions of Ethel Rosenberg and Mary Surratt yeah. in 1865, both largely innocent women executed for conspiracy. Not sure if I have a question other than I wonder if you have considered the similarities between the two. Yes. It, it, thank you, Ethan. It's, it, it is a good question because um, there are only two women in all of American history who have been executed for a federal crime and it's Ethel Rosenberg and Mary Surratt. And I am not a 19th century historian. I am not aware of the complexities of her case. Um, I believe it was true that she was cognizant of the conspiracy to either uh, kidnap Abraham Lincoln or ultimately assassinate him. Uh, but I, I don't want to you know, say too much, but, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting and in how, I, yeah, it's just a, a fascinating idea of looking at, at the role of women in these cases and how are they treated and are they treated differently because they're women and for so long the assumption was women are more moral and, you know, that kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's a really interesting, an interesting point. Thanks. Um, we're running out of time, but there is a question that I don't want to skip it. And it says, if we won the Korean War with the results of this Korean War bring a different outcome to the Rosenberg sentence. Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be amazing? I, it's a really, I, you know, a smart what if is really high, enlightening, right? I mean, you, you get what ifs that are like, you know, if Robert E. Lee had an AK-47 at Gettysburg. It's like, that's not plausible, but this is plausible, right? This is a plausible thing. What does it do? Um, it certainly takes the wind out of the sails of you caused the Korean War because the assumption was the Rosenbergs passed the atomic bomb to the Soviets. The Soviets, you know, said to North Korea, invade South Korea, we've got your back. That's not how it happened. And we now have documents that indicate that this was all had to do with China and really had very, very little to do with the atomic bomb, because if it had, that would have happened much earlier. Um, so it really is not as clear. But if the Americans are able to I mean, they do stop the spread of communism into South Korea. So that's something. But if they had united all of Korea as a democratic government, um, wow, it's it's a game changer. I guess it just depends when that happens, if it could have impacted the Rosenbergs. Would, they, would Eisenhower have considered commuting the sentence, maybe put 30 years, maybe get out and 20 for good behavior? I don't know. Gosh, I hadn't thought about that. That's a really interesting idea. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, thank you for that question. We like questions that challenge us. <laughs> All right, well, I don't see any other questions. So I will say thank you so much, Dr. Kloon, for this wonderful presentation. To everyone watching us, we just have a few announcements to make, so bear with us for just a few more moments. Um, continuing on with our theme of difficult decisions, um, we will welcome 
we will welcome Dr. Jeremy Black um, on Thursday, February 23rd for that Lunch and Learn mm -hmm. for Eisenhower, the Cold War, and the American Role. So please join us back here at the same, at the same time, the fourth Thursday for that program. We will also welcome Dr. Brenda Plummer on Tuesday, February 28th at 7 p.m. to also talk about the Cold War, and she will talk about the Cold War in African Americans. Um, so please join us 7 p.m. Central Time. We also want to thank the Jeff Cope Foundation and the Eisenhower Foundation for their um, support, which we would not be able to have these programs without them. So thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you.